Hello and welcome back. I hope you remember that in the last lecture we introduced normal form games and we also introduced the notion of mixed Nash equilibria. Today we will continue talking about mixed Nash equilibria and we will show that they always exist. Well, not, not always always, but actually Hello and welcome back. I hope you remember that last time we introduced mixed Nash equilibria in normal form games. And today we will show that they always exist in finite games. We'll come to this um, in a bit, but let's first recap what a normal form game is. So far, all games that we were considering in this class were actually cost minimization games, but you might as well consider payoff maximization games. And as it turns out, this will be easier today to talk about these payoff maximization games. So what the, will this look like? Here, this is the definition of a normal form payoff maximization game. So again, we have n players and each of the players has a set of pure strategies but instead of a cost function the player now has a payoff function which we usually uh, write as ui and now in a state s so where each of the players chooses one of their uh, their strategies this uh, player i has payoff ui of s so far, we introduced this with cost ci, and as a matter of fact, this is entirely equivalent because um, these um, payoffs may be arbitrary numbers as well as the, uh, the costs may be. So if we just set ci of s to minus ui of s, then we're getting exactly uh, a cost minimization game. So here the goal would be to maximize your payoff uh, and this would be exactly the same as minimizing minus your payoff. And this way, the notion of a, uh, of a mixed Nash equilibrium and also of a pure Nash equilibrium just generalizes in a pretty straightforward way. Um, but as it turns out for today, it is a little more natural to talk about um, payoff maximization that you actually want to get out of the game as much as possible rather than minimizing your own cost. What will also be useful today is this lemma that we proved last time, showing that a mixed strategy sigma i is a best response against some choices of the other players sigma minus i if and only if the payoff that this player is getting under sigma i is no less than what this player could be getting if he or she switched to any, um, <clears throat> any pure strategy SI prime. So this means we always, to show that a, um, a mixed strategy is a best response, we actually only have to compare to possible deviations to pure strategies rather than comparing to all possible mixed strategies. So what do we want to prove today? Today we will want uh, we will prove Nash's theorem which tells us that mixed Nash equilibria always exist. Um, but this has a small caveat namely they only exist if there are finitely many players and finitely many strategies, finitely many pure strategies per player. Um, but if we have such a finite normal form game, then there is always a mixed Nash equilibrium. Let's write this down.
every finite normal form game has a mixed Nash equilibrium. And what do we mean by, by a finite normal form game? This means that we have finitely many players and finitely many pure strategies per player. How do we prove such a theorem? Well, this now works in a very different way uh, compared to proving the existence of pure Nash equilibria and congestion games. Because what we apply now is a fixed point theorem. So we actually only do an existence proof. Our proof will actually not be constructive in a way that we show, okay, this is the way you can find this equilibrium. More precisely, we will apply Brouwer's fixed point theorem. What does that state? Every continuous function f from d to d mapping a compact and convex non-empty subset D, which is a subset of R to the M to itself has a fixed point. X star and what has to hold for that? It has to hold that f of x star is equal to x star. So what does all of this mean? Maybe let's first just digest this theorem and let's understand what all of these things mean. I guess you have an, un uh, uh, an understanding of what continuous mean. I hope you also know what compact and convex mean. Uh, but nonetheless, let's go through all of these things slowly uh, so that we actually see what they mean and why this statement isn't actually extremely surprising. So let's start with convexity. So we say that a set D, which is a subset of R to the M, is convex if for all X and Y, which lie in D, and all lambda in the interval from 0 to 1, we have that lambda times x plus 1 minus lambda times y is in that set. So I hope you know what this means. Um, 
but let's see this in a in a, in the typical example this is a convex set whereas this is not why that well um, we could for example choose this as the point x or this as the point x and you this might be the point y and this might be the point y or any other two points we might choose and now what happens well here on the left hand side regardless of how we choose these two points the line connecting these two points is always also in the set so any point on the line connecting these two points is always um, in in the set as well whereas here well for some points this might be true but for the two points that i chose this is not true if i connect the two then there's for example this point here right in the middle uh, which is not contained in the set okay this is convexity now we also wanted to have that the set d is compact so this is convexity but now we also wanted that the set d is compact what is that d is compact if it is closed and bounded what does that mean well we now have two further things we have to explain namely closed and bounded so what does closed mean uh, d is Um, is closed if it if it contains all its limit points. What does that mean? Well, we consider any sequence of points in that set. And this sequence should be converging um, which means nothing but that the limit exists um, then this limit is also contained in the set D. Good, this is closed. And what does bounded mean? Well, that's something pretty straightforward, namely that it is bounded, so um, that there is an upper bound on the norm of every point in that set. Okay, what 
what norm are we talking about? So it actually doesn't matter. Um, so this might be any norm. Uh, for example, you might think of the Euclidean norm um, because that's often very natural to think about, although it, it might be easier to think of, for example, about the maximum norm so that every component has an upper bound. There is a component, uh, there is an upper bound so that no component ever exceeds any of these values. Good. So let's consider a few examples um, in R to the one, because that's usually the easiest to think about. Um, which sets are compact there? So which of them are closed? Which of them are, are bounded? Well, if we, for example, take the closed interval from 0 to 1, this is both closed and bounded. Why is it bounded? Because um, no, uh, none of the points will have an absolute value bigger than 1. If we now take the uh, an interval that is open on one side or on both sides, then this is not closed. But in this case, it is still bounded. So we now just excluded the zero, so it's still bounded, but um, it is not closed anymore. Why that? Because you could take the sequence of one over n, this converges to zero. All of the numbers one over n are contained in our set, but the limit, which is zero, is not contained in the set. So that's why this is not closed. Um, alternatively, we might have the interval from zero to infinity. Um, this, again, is closed if the zero is contained, but it is not bounded of course, because there is no upper bound on the, um, on the values that we see in that set. At the same time, all of these three examples are actually convex because in, on, on the reals, this just means that this, uh, any two, uh, we, we have a connected interval. If you have two disconnected intervals, then you won't be convex. Or if you just have, if any point in between is missing uh, two points uh, of the set, then uh, you are not convex. So the other thing that is important for the theorem is continuity of the function. What is that? I hope you still have the intuition of what continuity means, but let's write it down formally. It is continuous at a point x if for all epsilon greater than zero there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all y the following holds if the norm of x minus y is smaller than delta, then also the norm of f of x minus f of y is smaller than epsilon. And a function is called continuous
if it is continuous in its domain. Okay, so now we have a function that is continuous and its domain is compact and convex. And what Browse fixed point theorem tells us is that there is always a fixed point. And on the reals, this is actually pretty easy to see uh, because there, as I was already saying, the notions of um, convexity and um, compactness are very easy to understand. Let's see that. Let's draw such a function in on the reals. So we'll have a compact set, which is nothing but a closed interval. Um, a compact and convex set is nothing but a closed interval. And so let's try to visualize this here. So we're mapping some somehow from this set to itself. So we'll also have the point A here. And the point here, B here as well. And what's now the point? Well, we now have a function that maps from the closed interval a to b to the closed interval a to b and it is also continuous. So what does this mean? Well, somehow this function has to get from here, the, the graph of this function somehow has to get from here to here and how will it get there? Well, it has to be continuous. Somehow we may have to draw this just um, with, without um, any gaps. So what might this look like? We just start from here and somewhere we get to the right. And what is it that now happens? Well, this function at some point has to actually intersect the diagonal because it is continuous. So there has to be some intersection with the diagonal at any point. And what does this now mean? Well, for example, we have this intersection with the diagonal. In my example, there are now actually two more intersections, but these are fixed points because here the function maps exactly to, um, to the same value. So this is a point x at which f of x is equal to x. So now we want to prove this theorem uh, that every finite normal form game has a uh, mixed Nash equilibrium, and we will use uh, Brouwer's fixed point theorem, which I hope we have now an understanding of. So, what will now be the crucial thing to do? Well, we have to find this function f with a property that the existence of a fixed point of this function means that there is a mixed Nash equilibrium in a respective game. So more precisely, we take any normal form game and we somehow build from this, this function f. And then we know 
that this function f has a fixed point and we now have to construct this function f in a smart way so that this fixed point actually corresponds to a mixed Nash equilibrium. So let's do that. So we consider any normal form game and without, uh, sorry, we consider any finite normal form game and without loss of generality We assume that, well, on the one hand, it is a payoff maximization game. And on the other hand, we assume that this set of players is numbered from 1 through n and each of the sets si is numbered from 1 through mi. So why do we do this? Well, now the set of mixed strategies can actually be understood as a subset of r to the m, where m is the sum of all these mi. Or so why do we do this? We do this because now the set of mixed strategies of a player can be considered uh, the set of mi dimensional vectors or the set of all mixed states, so having a mixed strategy for all players, this can be understood as a subset of R to the M, where M is now the sum of numbers of pure strategies that all players have. So um, once again, the set X of mixed states can be understood as a subset of R to the M for M being the sum over all players summing up their number of pure strategies. So what does this mean? Well, I hope you remember that we understand mixed strategies just as mi dimensional vectors. So a mixed strategy for player i is nothing but an mi dimensional vectors. And let's now stitch these all together. And then we have an m dimensional vector where m is the sum of these mi. And now we have to construct this function f, which maps these mixed states to mixed states such that any fixed point of this function corresponds to a mixed Nash equilibrium. By the way, we, what we won't do today is showing that this set x is actually compact and convex. Uh, that's an easy exercise and that's something you might want to do yourself to actually figure out why is this now convex? Why is this set of mixed strategies actually a convex set? Why 
do I get if I take uh, one mixed strategy and another mixed strategy and if I draw the line between these, so do this mixing with the lambda that we had before, why is this again a mixed strategy? This is something that you might want to prove yourself. Um, so how do we define this function f? To define this, we now first define some auxiliary functions. Um, let's first write down the definition. Um, let's take such a mixed state, a player, and an alternative strategy in an alternative pure strategy for this player. And we now let phi subscript i comma j of x be the maximum of zero and ui of j comma x minus i minus ui of x. What does this mean? Well, we are now playing, suppose we are playing this mixed state X. And now consider one of the players I and one uh, alternative pure strategy for this player. Then this player might unilaterally move to this pure strategy. And then his new utility or payoff will be the payoff that they get if, if uh, that he gets if he chooses j and the others still use x minus i. Um, and let's now compare this to the payoff that this player was getting before. This is ui of x. And Let's take the, the maximum of this difference and zero. So this means if it is worse for player i to switch to the pure strategy uh, um, j, then this is zero. Otherwise, it is how much this player actually gains from switching to this pure strategy. Um, I now claim that this is actually a continuous function. Why is that? Well, each of these functions ui is actually continuous and that's, this makes this phi also continuous because, well, this is then a continuous function, this is a continuous function uh, taking the max of two continuous functions still gives us a continuous function. And why is the utility a continuous function? Uh, this is because we can write ui of x as a very long sum. So we would take the sum of all strategies of player one and the sum of all strategies for player two and so on up to player n. And then we would multiply the probability that um, player one is using the strategy up to player n is using this respective strategy. And then we are, have a pure state and then we just take the ui of s. 
This is pretty obviously a continuous function in x. And therefore, also these phi functions are continuous. Okay, with the help of these phi functions, we can now define our f function that we were looking for. So now define f of x equal to x prime. So this will now be, of course, another mixed strategy vector having a mixed strategy for every of these players. And how much probability should player I put on pure strategy J? Well, this should be how much he's putting on this before, plus the value of the phi function. And all of this divided by one plus the sum of these phi functions. Okay, first thing to observe is that this x prime will again be a feasible mixed state. Why is this? How would you prove this? Well, the thing that you should do is first of all see that all of these are non-negative. Okay, that's kind of easy to see because everything that we're involving here will be non-negative, so why should anything be negative? And then what you also have to show is that if you, for any fixed i, you take the sum of all j, um, uh, the say, you take the sum over all j of the x prime ij, then this will sum up to one. And this is indeed also true, and uh, just because these xij, they sum up to one, and then you get the sum of these um, phi's, and this is exactly your denominator. So this is why we can observe that x prime is again a feasible mixed state. So this means that x prime is again a feasible fixed uh, mixed state. And this means our function f is actually well defined. So f mapping from x to x is well defined. Um, furthermore, this function f is continuous. Why is this? Because all of these phi functions are continuous. That's what we proved before. So also um, this, um, this sum and this ratio, this will also be continuous. So this means 
there is some x star such that f of x star equals x star. This comes exactly from the fixed point theorem. Great. Now all we have to do is we have to show that this fixed point actually corresponds to a mixed Nash equilibrium. How do we show that this is a mixed Nash equilibrium? Well, let's use our phi functions. What did these phi functions mean? These phi functions meant that um, the, the, the value of the phi function means how much can I gain from deviating to this respective pure strategy. And if we show, well, you cannot gain anything from moving there, then we are in a mixed Nash equilibrium. So once again, formally, we have to show that being a fixed point implies that phi subscript i comma j of x star is equal to zero. So this means that you cannot gain anything, player i cannot gain anything from moving to uh, strategy j. It might even be that this player is using some, uh, losing something, um, but we said, okay, this phi value is never negative. If this player is lose, would be losing something, then we just set this value to zero. So let's do this. Let's consider some fixed player and consider this player J prime. And this player strategy J prime such that U I F J prime comma X minus I star is smallest. among all j prime that have a positive probability. So once again, we are now considering this fixed point. And in this fixed point, we are now um, considering one of the players and we want to show that this player cannot actually improve his or her uh, payoff by switching to a different strategy. And as we know, we only have to compare this to pure strategies. And we do this now by just considering all these fee functions. And what we now do is pretty simple. We now consider um, this, the, the well, this player has to put probability mass on some of these strategies. And among all the strategies that this player is putting probability mass on, let's consider the one uh, where he or she has this gets the smallest payoff if now this player moved to only playing always this strategy, J prime.
Now there's a smart move. Namely, we can write the utility that this player i, or the payoff that this player i is getting in uh, state x star. This is equal to the following. Take the sum over all strategies, all his or her strategies. And now take the probability um, of this strategy. And now consider only the probability and uh, the, the payoff that you would get if you were always playing this strategy. This is true because the choices of the different players are independent. And this allows us to actually now just move out the randomness of player i. So this is all the, the randomness of player i and all other randomness is still hidden inside this ui of j comma x minus i. Um, so, we can now write ui of x star like this. And what we can now do is we can now blow up out all of these things by what we're getting if we take uh, replacing ui of j comma x minus i star um, by uh, if we replace j by j prime there. Good. Why is this true? Well, let's it's not entirely trivial to see this, but it's actually not complicated either. So take this quantity here. Well, if this x i comma j star is greater than zero, then we know that this ui term um, is can only be bigger than the respective ui term if we replace j by j prime. Or alternatively, this x uh, star i comma j, this is zero. And then it doesn't actually matter how big this is. So then we might as well replace this. So um, if we do all this, then we can write this as ui of j comma x minus i star. Here we use that just these x i star, they sum up uh, x i comma j star, they sum up to exactly one. Good. What does this now mean? Let's now consider the phi function for j prime. At the point x star. How was this defined? Well, this was the maximum of zero and ui of j prime comma x minus i star minus ui of x star. How big is this? Well, this here, if we just use uh, what we had uh, what we've just observed, we see that this is definitely at most zero, so all of this will be zero. Good. Okay, so far we haven't actually used that our point x star is a fixed point, and this is what we will use now. So far we only know that there is this one strategy j prime for which this phi function is zero and this is what we will um, exploit in just a minute.
So now let's use that this is a fixed point. We now have that if we actually consider component J prime, then well, it is also, also this component doesn't change under if the function f. Okay, what do we know about this? Well, we know that this phi i comma j of x prime, that this is zero. So we might as well drop this. Good. And what else do we know? We know that um, this x star of i comma j prime, this is positive. This was one of our assumptions earlier um, because we were only considering the j prime for which um, this is positive. Okay, so this is something that we might also apply. So we might just divide both sides by this value and then we have that 1 is equal to 1 over 1 plus the sum of these phi functions. And if you now do the math, then you see that this means that these P functions they all add up to zero and this has to mean that they are all all of those are zero because otherwise well we know that none of them is negative so how would this work in any possible way because well all of them um, are non-negative um, so and if the sum is zero this means that they all have to be zero and this actually completes our proof because now we've shown that all of these values, all of these phi function values are exactly zero, so player i cannot gain anything from moving to any of his or her pure strategies. Once again, how did this work? Maybe let's quickly go over this again, um, because I find this a bit confusing always. So um, let's start from the top. We defined um, this function f in a smart way via these phi functions. We define these phi functions to mean um, that the uh, how much you gain from switching to this strategy. And then we observed, okay, uh, we can construct a function f. And this function f kind of shifts probability mass so that if you can gain something, then you gain some, uh, then, uh, then you, you move to this point. This is somehow my, my intuitive understanding, although this is certainly, we are not saying that F is mapping X to a best response or so. Why aren't we doing this, by the way? Because this wouldn't be continuous. We, Construct this in a smart way so that this still is continuous. And 
uh, we only slightly shift any um, any pure uh, any mixed state towards a mixed state, which is better unless the state we were starting from was a mixed Nash equilibrium anyway. And then we identified one strategy which we used. This strategy was the um, was the worst one among the ones that the player is actually using in a fixed point. And among these, um, and we see, okay, the payoff of this player in the mixed strategy cannot actually be better, uh, uh, or can only be better than the payoff of this worst mixed strategy. Uh, worst pure strategy. And then we use this because this means that for this strategy the phi function has to be zero, but as we are in a fixed point, still somehow the probability mass also on this strategy doesn't go down if we, well, put this entire state again through the function f. And this is exactly the point why this has to be a mixed Nash equilibrium, because even this strategy won't go down, so this means that actually one has to be happy with this point. Apparently, even this strategy, you wouldn't want to reduce your probability, so this means that eventually, even the worst that you're playing, you're happy with, this means that you're actually happy with all of your strategies. Okay, so now we know that mixed Nash equilibria always exists, but unfortunately our proof doesn't come at all with any algorithm. So we don't have any idea how to compute these mixed Nash equilibria. And this is particularly annoying now because there's even not a trivial strategy, a trivial algorithm that gives us something in finite time. For uh, congestion games, even if you didn't know anything about congestion games, one thing that you could do to find a pure Nash equilibrium is just try out all possible states, and then you might just find one, uh, find a pure Nash equilibrium. But now there are actually infinitely many mixed states. So what can you do in finite time? Well, there are smart algorithms for this, um, but the only thing I want to explain to you now is what you can actually do in finite time uh, to still find a mixed Nash equilibrium. How do we do that? Well, what, do, what we do is we consider a bimatrix utility maximization game or payoff maximization game. We have for a row player, we have a payoff matrix. And also for the column player, we have a payoff matrix. We now call X the row players mix strategy and Y the column players mix strategy.
The nice thing about all of this notation is that it is now pretty easy to write the um, the payoff that a player gets under this uh, under these mixed strategies. So what we now have is that the payoff of the row player is exactly equal to x transpose times a times y. And the payoff for the column player is equal to x transpose times b times y. And to keep things simple, we also, without loss of generality, we assume that all entries in A and B are positive. If they aren't, we just add the same value to all of them and then nothing actually changes. Um, now, we need some additional definition, namely the so-called support. The support of a mixed strategy is exactly the set of pure strategies that this player is putting a positive probability on. So that um, it, the, the, the pure strategies that get a non-zero probability. Good. By the way, this is something that we also used in the proof of uh, Nash theorem. There we also took one strategy in the support of the current um, of the current uh, mixed strategy. Good. This now, with all of this notation, we can now rewrite our initial lemma that a best response is a, well, a, a mixed strategy is a best response if and only if um, there is no better pure strategy that is better for a unilateral deviation. We can once again write this down now with a slight change in notation. So what we now have is that x is the best response to y if and only if for all i in the support of x If we take the ith component in the vector a times y, this is equal to the maximum of all these entries. Recall that um, any strategy that we're playing on, that we're playing has to be a best response. So everything in the support has to be a best response. And this now means um, that if we now take this here, this is how much we would be getting if we were playing um, strategy I against strategy uh, Y. So pure strategy I against mixed strategy Y. And this has to be no smaller than the best choice that we have here. Analogously, we might as well write the same thing for player Y or for the row player, uh, for, sorry, for the column player.
Okay. So this is a lemma that we've seen before. Now we can actually rewrite the problem of finding a mixed Nash equilibrium um, as by now just writing down some conditions that have to be fulfilled. And those are the following. So x comma y, which is a pair of mixed strategies, is a mixed Nash equilibrium. If I know here, There are U and V, which are positive, such that well, on the first of all, um, both players put probability mass in total, which sums up to one. Then what we need is that um, there the The payoff that you're getting from any strategy is no smaller than U for the row player or no smaller than V for the column player. And also that the ones that are in the support, those give us exactly U respectively, exactly V. And also, those have to be non-negative vectors. So all we want to do now is we want to kind of rewrite this problem of finding these vectors x and y so that actually we eliminate u and v in all of this. Because how should we know u and v? Um, so, right, x tilde for x divided by v, y tilde for y divided by u, and now all we have to find is the following. We will have to find vectors such that all the x tildes sum up to 1 over v. The y tildes components sum up to 1 over u. Every component of A times Y tilde is at most 1. Every component of X tilde times B is at most 1. And every component for which i is in the support of 
y tilde, uh, sorry, x tilde, um, the, this component has of a times x tilde has to be exactly 1, and analogously, we have the same thing for y tilde times d. Good. So where are we now? Well, effectively, if we're able to solve this down here, if we have a solution to this down here, then we can immediately get a solution to this up here. This is really straightforward because, well, just see what the uh, x tilde components sum up to. Um, then um, divide by this or multiply, I'm not sure. Um, and then you immediately get back here. Okay, that's actually... Uh, and, and the same thing with the with the y tilde. So if you have a solution to this down here, you immediately have a solution to this up here, and then we're actually perfectly fine, because if we have a solution to this up here, then we have a mixed Nash equivalent. We found it. Good. So, um, how do we find a solution to this? Well, Let's see, what do we actually have to do? We have to find a vector x tilde and a vector y tilde such that, um, well, um, these things have to be true, what's written here on the right hand side, and then there have to be u and v such that this is true. But this here, this is actually very easy to fulfill because this is the only point where u and v show up. So only here u and v show up. Um, and whenever we have a vector x tilde and a vector y tilde for which these, um, these things on the right hand side hold, then, and furthermore, these are non-negative vectors, and all of the components, um, and, and one of the components is strictly positive, then there have to be this u and v. So, it suffices to find x tilde and y tilde, which should both be non-zero, for which, well, these conditions that we had here, these conditions that we had on the right-hand side, uh, those still have to hold. So, let's copy them. Um, So here we are. And once again, we have a similar argument as before. When we have a solution to this down here, we immediately get a solution to this up there. And we know that if we have a solution to this, to this here, 
Then we have also a solution to what we had before. So we may from that actually also derive a mixed Nash equation. By the way, I somehow forgot to mention that these should be non-negative. So we now already have a pretty simple algorithm to at least compute this in finite time. We would try out all choices for the support of x tilde and y tilde. And then we just solve the system of linear equations. Um, we usually would get a unique solution to that. And then we have to verify whether also the um, inequalities still hold. So this gives us at least a finite time algorithm to compute a mixed Nash equilibrium. Namely, try out every choice for the support of x tilde, every support, uh, every choice for the support of y tilde, and well then just do all this stuff. This at least works in finite time because there's only finitely many choices for these supports. Unfortunately, of course, though there are exponentially many. Um, which makes this an exponential time algorithm. However, um, results from complexity theory actually tell us that it is very unlikely for there to be a polynomial time algorithm uh, for this problem. Nonetheless, um, this is still not extremely smart if you just try out everything. You know, even if you do have an exponential time algorithm, it is often better to not try out everything blindly, but follow some, some structured rule. For example, there is the so-called Lemke-Hausen algorithm, uh, which actually builds up this support by moving one uh, strategy into the support one after the other and actually figuring out which gives the best improvement. And this is kind of similar to the simplex algorithm that you use to solve linear programs, where you also have these uh, basic solutions and you move one variable in or one variable out at a time. Um, but we won't cover this in class because the most the, the thing that is actually imp most important to understand for, to understand the Lamka Hausen algorithm is the simplex algorithm, and we won't cover the simplex algorithm in this class. So this completes our discussion of the uh, of mixed Nash equilibrium. Today we've shown uh, that they always exist in finite normal form games. And we've also shown at least an approach to compute those in polynomial time. Nonetheless, uh, sorry, not in polynomial time, in finite time. Um, and as it turns out, there are other equilibrium concepts which are much easier to compute and maybe it's more reasonable to assume um, that they are um, that players actually play these 
weaker notion, only these weaker notions of equilibria because well, they are actually computable in polynomial time and, and so on. This is something that we'll cover later in this class. Thank you very much for your time for today. And I hope you enjoyed this and you learned a lot.